Hello, everyone. Uh, we are happy to come here for sharing our research. I'm CK Bradley Chen. I and my colleague, Indy and John, will share our research. Chimera IPT groups targets Taiwan Semiconductor vendors. So first, uh, let me introduce ourselves. I'm Zhong Kuan Chen. You can just call me CK. And my Twitter ID is Bradley13. I'm a security researcher. Um, after I get my PhD degree from National Jiao Tong University, I joined the SciCraft as a senior researcher. And uh, when I'm in university, I have published some research in academic conference. And I also published some research in a technical conference like the Hikam, VSCon, Rukam First, and Coblu Open Talk. I'm also a retired CTF player. I'm a founder uh, of Bamboo Fox CTF team uh, in National Jiao Tong University. And I also have the experience to join the uh, DEF CON final CTF in 2016 and 2018. I also lead our student to join some bug bounty program and discover some volunteers in QNAP and Synarch. I'm also an active member in Taiwan's security community. I'm a member of CHROOT, which is the best hacker group in Taiwan. And this year, HECON 2020, I will be a chairman of HECON Editorial Committee. And my partner, John, uh, he is a security researcher in SiteCraft and also have published his research in HECON. And he also found a Taiwan local hacker group, UCCU Hacker. And Indy Lin, uh, he is also the researcher, security researcher at SciCraft, and mainly focus on malware analysis and detection. And he also have shared his research in Hikam and Rukam, and often give the training in local security community. He is a reverse engineering hobbyist. And from his high school, he started to learn reverse engineering for game hacking and CTF. So we also introduced our company, SciCraft. Um, SciCraft is a star company in Taiwan, uh, which, which is just moved to its third year after its startup. And our company focuses on using AI to help solving the security problem. Currently, we have three product. The first one is Zenser, which is used for threat hunting, and Sakura, uh, which is used for APT investigation, and CyberTotal is a threat intelligence platform. With the help of this system, we can quickly analyze and analyze the APT campaign. So uh, today our talk uh, is a lot uh, helped by these uh, products. And our company also joined the uh, MITRE ATTCK evaluation in last year and competing with many top security vendors in the world and get a very nice result. If you are interested about it, you can uh, reference to our uh, public report in our blog. This is today's online. We will first give the introduction about Taiwan's semiconductor industry. And then we will illustrate the APT group, Kimela, that we discovered in these two years. And then we will go through the case study uh, to understand the activities of three actors. And then we will go deeper to see the three actors digital arsenal, uh, which introduced the malware and technical used by a taker. And then we will make the conclusion. Because Taiwan has a very special political position, so we always being attacked every year. In 2018, uh, the TSMC, one of the largest semiconductor vendors in Taiwan or even the world, is attacked by ransomware WannaCry. Uh, this attack held down their production line for two days and make the cost about 170 million. 
In 2019, Kaspersky has discovered the Shadow Hammer, which is a supply chain attack targeting ASUS. And this year, uh, our critical infrastructure is being attacked by the Colac ransomware. The CPC is an energy sector uh, and uh, who has a lot of gas station. So in this attack, a lot of the gas station is out of service and make many inconvenient and economic cost to Taiwan. Among uh, this industry, I think the semiconductor vendor is most important to Taiwan. And many people will say that the semiconductor is most important industry in Taiwan. That's because our government has paid a lot of resources to develop and help uh, these uh, vendors. And now Taiwan has already established ourselves as a leading player in this industry. And we have some uh, well-known leaders, include TSMC and MTK. In 2018, uh, our washer capacity is to take the first place in the world. And in 2019, our market sharing is to take the fourth place in the world. According to Taiwan's news, uh, we are the largest and fast-growing semiconductor equipment maker and make the revenue about 12 million. All of this show that Taiwan is take a very important role in the semiconductor landscape. So once the attack to Taiwan's semiconductor vendors happen, it will make a very uh, serious impact, like the TSMC ransomware. So the first, because this vendor take a lot of part in Taiwan's economy. So the attack to this vendor will of course make a serious impact to Taiwan's economy. And in the same time, it will also affect the entire global supply chain. Even though many research about this area will focus on the OT security, but in this report, we want to remind that the IT attacks uh, can be as dangerous as the OT attacks. In the attack to OT, uh, for example, they may make your production line hold but, and make it immediately damage. And compared to that, the attack to IT, for example, uh, leaks some important intelligence property. Even so, you, can not, you will not immediately identify the damage but it will have a long-term impact to the enterprise. So both the OT attack and IT attacks should be taken care and has equal importance. And Sycraft is a Taiwan local security uh, company. So we have a very high visibility in semiconductor vendors in Taiwan. And between the 2018 and 2019, we have monitored several attacks on these vendors and mostly victims are located at the Xinzhu Science Park. And Xinzhu Science Park is a century of Taiwan's high-tech industry, especially for the semiconductor vendors. And uh, we have published our first version of the report in April this year. And after we publish our report, we receive a lot of feedback from uh, uh, other security researcher, other vendors, and uh, our cooperation partner and our friend, and revealed that more than seven vendors were targeted by the sensor actor. So I would say that this attack is very intensive. The threat actor have the ability to uh, launch a large scale attack to many vendors at the same time. And the other noticeable point is that uh, the taker had a very in-depth understanding of the semiconductor industry. This attack is not only is not choose their victim randomly, but their attack is very precise and will coordinate. Uh, aside from the vendor themselves, their subsidiaries, competitor, and cooperation vendors in the supply chain will also be targeted. 
So I would say that the APT attack is from the past, which only attacked a single enterprise, a single point attack, to attack the supply chain. Now they are attacking on the entire industry surface. Um, as the activities, attack technique and tactics were very similar. So what we believe uh, this was the work of the same director. And we call this director the group Kimela. They are targeting the security vendors in Taiwan. And they use some more which is merged from different open source or commercial product. In our case, we discovered Dumper, Mimikas, and Copper Strike. So that's why we name it Chimela. Just like the Chimela is a merge uh, of a different animal, uh, the, uh, their malware is merged from the several uh, open source uh, malware. And in order to avoid attribution, their C2 is hosted in public cloud, like a Google App Engine and Azure. And their goal uh, is mostly focused on intelligent properties. They try to steal document, source code, SDK, of some projects related to chip. So from here, we can understand the uh, motivation of a taker. Here is our investigation overview. Our investigation period is in 2018 to 2019. And we investigate more than three vendors and analyze totally more than 30,000 endpoints. In today, we will share you two case studies. Why we choose these two vendors? The first reason is that these two vendors take a leading global position in their market segment. And the second reason is that because we get into investigation at a different timing. So an analytical perspective of a tech campaign was also different. For a company, uh, he is our long-term partner. So we regularly monitor their activities, which allow us to find more detail of the attacker's activities. And this information also enables us to track back to the root cause. So in the a uh, case study of a company, we want to show you the uh, activities of hackers and the root cause, how to track in the root cause. In the case study of a big company, it's a one-time IR service. So when we start the investigation, the attack has already happened for a long time. So we cannot recover everything back. But what we have is that we can monitor and identify the long-term activities of the directors. And we identify what kind of data, what kind of file was still by the taker. So what data was leaked in this case. So next, we will turn to our analysis, John, to share this two case study. OK, thanks to CK. So I'm John. And I will next present about the two case study. And before we start the case study, I just want to mention the following slide and the every machine and the username are the identifier and these are not original name. And the first case we want to do is the accompanying. So following is the accompanying status overview. So, a company is our uh, long-term partner. So, the threat actor activity day is very short time with discovery and a stop. And uh, we found that uh, 50 endpoint and six user account were compromised. And we found a four malware and an eight C2 server. And uh, we will introduce uh, on the C2 server and the malware later on. And the right hand side is our uh, MI generate investigation graph about told us uh, what endpoint has been compromised and uh, the compromised endpoint how to later when the later move later movement to the another endpoint and the dropper which malware so it's a 
a simple timeline to help an uh, investigator to understand the, what happened on this environment. And then the first malware we found is the uh, Cobalt Strike Beacon. Cobalt Strike Beacon, the threat actor used the Cobalt Strike Beacon and pretend as a Google Update. And the, the Cobalt Strike Beacon also will migrate the payload into the other process. The first, we found the Cobalt Strike Beacon, we searched on the files total and we found nothing. And this one means the threat actor possibly customized their different malware backdoor for the different user and the account, uh, and the endpoint. So we found the two different file hash in the two endpoints. And the Cobalt Strike Beacon has a, has a user hosting service for their C2 communication. So these are hard to uh, identify for the network security device. And uh, because the Google, they also they use the uh, Google, pretend as a Google update and uh, they connect to a Google Cloud service. So it's phase I can see a reasonable effort logic. But uh, it is an interesting point is about the uh, the first day, the threat actor use a Google Cloud platform, but the second day after they get the new endpoint, they switch the hosting server. This is quite interesting. But uh, in our investigator point of view, we think because the threat actor is a team. So every operator has uh, their different, uh, use the, uh, they prefer use the different hosting server and the, and the hosting service. So they switch the hosting service to the another, another provider. And uh, we found the first we found a uh, PC China is, uh, is a uh, deploy from the server Lauren. So. How they deploy is uh, they use uh, a schedule task. And uh, there's a, uh, a text time is before the type, before the, uh, the employee get off uh, work. So because they pretend as a Google update and even they trigger the security alert, maybe they will handle the security event tomorrow because there's a Google update. Maybe the binary has updates or trigger the false party for the antivirus. So there's a reason they execute the attack before the get off work. And then we trace back to the server Lauren. So we found the, the ls 2 remote execution tool in the server Lauren. So they use a big night program like the schedule tasker and the, the WNIC. So the schedule tasker actually Use uh, in a multiple endpoint and uh, the reason they use a schedule task not just for the persistence, they use a schedule task just for the execution and uh, they also use a WIC. But there's an interesting point about why does, why does threat hatter, threat hatter use a WIC and the schedule task? Why they just choose a one tool? Why they use a multiple tool? The reason you they use the WNIC and the schedule tasker is a WNIC can use the first, the WNIC can use a catch credential. And the second is a WNIC can get a STD out information. So in this uh, thread, they use the WNIC to check the network con communication, check the endpoint can has a network communication to the internet. And then they use a schedule taker to deploy their malware. And then we trace back to the uh, server order so we can, due to the previous finding, we can uh, add uh, to the instant information to server order has later move on to the three endpoint. 
and we found the server load has remotely collect the registry and the NTDS.dat in the server in the domain controller. And uh, they use archive tool. The archive tool is renamed as uh, recordtv.ms. So they collect these two files, registry and the NTDS.dat. So why? The, so I will introduce quickly explain the NTDS started. NTDS started is the Windows AD data. It's which it contains the Win Windows AD username, password, email account, something like this, all the useful information in the AD environment. But the database is encrypted. So the encrypted key is stored in the registry. So that's why the reason the threat need to collect the registry and the, the NTDS.data the file. So the threat already collect the, the AD database. And the, why the server has uh, this kind of malicious activity? So our MI investigation tell us the there's a before the st attack start there's a um declare schedule task deploy the Cobalt Strike beacon to server Lauren. So as you can see the screenshot, there's a schedule task to the server Lauren and the put, use the Google update pretend as a, a uh use a Cobalt Strike and pretend as a Google update. And there is a one time in one time execution and it starts at the 1958. So we chase back to the MB Clear. So in the MB Clear timeline, we discover the schedule will well executed in the 1958. But the command has been executed. It's just before the six minute, six minutes ago before the, uh, 1958. So we check the timeline. We found there's a, before the command is queued, there's a IP1 has a RDP to MP clear. So this is uh, highly suspicious, uh, the, the cause of the, this attack. So after the, actually after the, the threat at, uh, uh, RDP to the MB layer, they use the anti user to do some reconnaissance about the uh, user information because, the, <clears throat> because the environment username are, uh, serialized so they can enumerate the, Environment domain account to get some information, and they store the f store the information on the record TV lib log. So after they collect this uh, data and they use the record TV MS to do the data exploration. So they use a one byte modified Win IR software and. Uh, Rename as a record TV DMS and the uncheck.dmp and the ju check.exe pertain as a, the legit the software. And the, the same file has been found in the other endpoint. So based on the previous technique and the legit software, the install, we think this is a signature technique about the of the, our report operation chimera. And then we check back into the who RTP the MB clear. So we found this IP1 and IP1 is a uh, on scan cost and they relate to the uh, many user come in the whole environment. So we check into the IP1. So we found there's a fit, there's a share host. And uh, it's a, actually it's a VPN host. So VPN host can be compromised. So in our opinions, we think never use a VPN as the only line of uh, your defense. This is uh, above our first case study.
and uh, I will introduce a sick case study about the becoming. And uh, the becoming is an IR case. And uh, I just want to quick overview about uh, why we do the IR case about the becoming. Because becoming already been compromised, but they don't know. And the uh, becoming has a big cover a uh, business collaboration with a uh, C company and the C company is our, our friend and uh, due to the business collaboration B company and C company has a network connect communication and the C company security discovers some anomaly activity from B company so C company introduced us to the help investigation on the B company so Becoming has been hacked uh, starting the 2018 and uh, until the 2019. And then we look into the 140,000, 40,000 event and then we found a 40 common mass endpoint and a lot of the uh, data leak. And uh, the, uh, and uh, the, uh, becoming case study, we didn't find a Google update, but uh, we found a lesser partial attack. And uh, they use a partial attack as a, uh, they use a partial script and the uh, execute the Cobalt Strike beacon and uh, migrate to the SVC host. And uh, we found this, uh, partial attack on the 10 endpoint and the uh, crossing and uh, include the two domain controller. And then the, just like a first case study, the C2 communication is used a uh, uh, hosting, ser hosting server. So like uh, the Google Cloud Platform and uh, also in this case study, then you also use uh, Microsoft Azure. So it's uh, hard to track down the threat actor. Just like we previously mentioned, the C, the becoming already has a serious hack. So the human investigation is hard to address the, what endpoint has been compromised. So we use our AI investigator to help us to figure out what happened in the environment. And we also, so this graph is our, our AI generate. And this graph also tells us the, Domain controller already has been compromised and the domain controller also connect to this unmanaged endpoint. It means we didn't scan the endpoint. So it tells us our investigator to need to do some investigation about uh, this endpoint to check the compromise scope. And uh, because the thread starting the 2018, they all, 2018, they already has a compromise, uh, becoming. And, uh, they come back every quarterly to get uh, some new file, new information on the big company. And, uh, but their infrastructure, uh, compromise scope didn't extend until 2019, November, they sort of swear Threat editor deploy a new weapon we call scan turn key injector. And after the scan handling injector deployed, we, the threat editor has a extended their compromise scope. So it means the scan handling injector is well, works for them to get the environment. So our colleague will introduce the malware power in the next song later on. And then we found the, in the first case study and the second case study, the thread use a similar ski, uh, password schema to archive the, uh, uh, the IR, IR file. And the, uh, is a, and the, uh, they pretend the Win IR software as a record TV, a JU check, firmware dialog, something like digital file name. And uh, the thread editor, has collected the leak file name. Leak has, has collected a leak file, which we de-identify and, uh, just like the, they collect the project, 
portrait map and uh, the backup workspace and uh, the chip and SDK information and the installation guide. So our, our assumption is uh, the threat actor is not just for uh, creating the environment. They are doing this, uh, stealing, stealing the intelligence property. So we think the threat is uh, possibly is a business spy or state sponsor attack to benefit some country want to benefit their certain industry. So we are not sure which one, but we can feel sure is the threat target is not is is just for the stealing the intelligence puppet. So the target is the target very straightforward. So this, so this is uh, my part to the case study and I will uh, to turn to the, our next presenter, Indy. Hi, I'm Indy, reverse engineer from SciCraft. I'm going to introduce the Actress Digital Arsenal. We want to tr share three main tools they used to carry out this attack. The first we are going to talk about is Cobalt Strike. Cobalt Strike is a commercial red team operation framework. They use Cobalt Strike Beacon as their primary, primary backdoor in these intrusions. For the persistency, they override Google Chrome update utility with their Cobalt Strike Beacon. Thus, there is no any new auto run entry was created. So, it will lower the chance to be caught. We found this backdoor on several company, so we link the intrusions events together. Cobalt Strike has two components, Stager and Beacon. Stager is a little show code that can load another payload. It will be useful if the payload size was limited or you don't want to deploy entire backdoor to the victim. Beacon is the full function backdoor. Just like any other backdoor, it has capability to transfer files, set up tunnel, code execution, and others. Our product detected some suspicious memory block, which contains a Cobalt Strike beacon. As you can see on the slide, it is a PE file and a shell code payload. So, Cobalt Strike Beacon and Metasploit Metapreter both use this technique, the hybrid payload. This technique is to embed shell code into the PE file header. The PE magic header, MZ, could be decoded as valid instructions. It will be decoded as POP R10 under 64-bit architecture and decrease EBP pop EDX under 32-bit architecture. These instru instructions will work fine in most of contexts. So you can ignore these instructions and append shellcode after it. The shellcode will locate its address and execute the reflective loader to load PE image in memory. It is this assembly output of stager. There are two types of stager. One uses NumPipe. Uh, another uses WinHttp library. So stager could be used to download payload from remote server or be in use during process migration. Cobalt Strike uses a special strategy to inject payload into other process. First, Cobalt Strike will spawn a new process or choose an existing process as target. Then, it will inject the shellcode into the target process. We call the shellcode stager. The real payload will be transferred through named pipe and then executed by stager. This strategy will bypass some sandbox or emulation-based scanning. Here is the WinRAR. It is a popular compression software. It was used in this operation. The actor uses 
rr.exe to compress and encrypt the files they stole. They try to ambiguate the program with existing path recorded tv.library-ms in the same folder. The reason why we mention this file is this file is different from the original one. So we grab this old version of WinRER and compare it with the one that actually used. We found the difference part was located in code section and such patch may crash the program. We have two hypotheses. First is the actor change the byte to make file hash different. So hash best detec detection will not find that file is rr.exe. If your organization do not use WinRER, the file may be detected and trigger some investigation. Uh, the second hypothesis, it was uploaded to VirusTotal in 2009. We think it is just a bit flip during copy judged by the file age. It is highly possible at that time. Now we are going to talk about the most interesting malware used in this operation, the skeleton key injector. We found a unique malware that made with two open source hacking tools, Dumpers and Mimikaz. I believe everyone here had heard about Mimikaz. It is a well-known hacking tool to dump credentials from lsauce.exe memory. But it is, it has more capability like bypass group policy and spawn command line prompt, task manager or registry editor. This malware has been found on at least 10 domain controllers. So uh, we found bunches of forwarded import entry and indicates that it is a DLL proxy. Actually, exploit DLL hijacking vulnerability to persist and escalate privileges. Maybe you don't know this hacking tool. Dumpert is made by the security company called Outblank. It is a proof of concept program to use direct system call on Windows. Unlike Linux, we can't directly use system call in show code because Windows system call numbers changed from release to release. The only stable interface is exported function from the shared libraries. That's why Windows Show Code must rely on them and always begins with locating functions in memory by traverse PEB, loader data, and PE structures. So how do Dumper doing it? First, it uses RTL get version to determine Windows version and select different embedded show code, uh, embedded system call functions depend on the Windows version. After, th after that, you can bypass any user space hook and doing anything you want without trigger alert or get blocked. And here is a code shows that how does dumpert embed system call in its body. It will choose the different embed, embedded uh, system call functions. For the one who don't know what a skeleton key is, skeleton key is an APT malware discovered by Dell SecureWorks in 2015. It will implant a backdoor password to a domain controller in an active directory environment. Then, attacker can authenticate as any user as they want with the backdoor password. Meanwhile, original password was never affected any other wrong passwords still will be rejected. So how does skeleton key implemented? It will write, it will alter the authentication flow by hooking some crypto functions in lsas.exe, more specifically in KDC service, the key distribution service. Although original skeleton key malware was never released publicly, Author of Mimikat still made his own implementation. 
The actor made skunky injector by merging dumpered and mimikas. The they copied necessary code from dumpered and mimikas. Then modified functions in mimikas to use embedded system call functions from dumpered. So if your protection product did not use mini filter driver, which means did not put the hook in kernel space, the skeleton key will be invisible. Skeleton key is a very powerful weapon against Active Directory because you don't need to dump administrator credentials for lateral movements. If you use administrator credential to access endpoints in a domain, you may trigger a lot of alerts. But if you log in with normal users, the situation will be different. It leaves nearly no clue, only bunches of logon success event. Most administrator or investigator will ignore normal user logon events easily. And skeleton key cannot be removed easily without reboot. It will be painful to reboot all your domain controllers because you may break your organization's daily routine. Now, CK will make a conclusion for us about this talk. Finally, uh, let me give some conclusion about our research. So here is some takeaway. In this report, we disclosure a large-scale APT attacks targeting semiconductor vendors, and more than seven vendors were compromised. And this attack is a precisely attack and targeting leading semiconductor vendors and also attack their subsidiaries, partners, and competitors. And their goal is stealing intelligent properties, document, source code, and SDK, which will make long-term damage to the victim. In the technical part, the attacker utilized various open source and general tools to make the attribution harder, and they will merge the different kind of malware and insert their customized code to make their own malware. In the two case study we are shared, the AD and VPN was compromised, which show that enterprise should consider the resilience of their IT system and avoid to rely on a single security service. And the technical skeleton key is used in this case, in this case. And this technical is rarely used in the past. Uh, however, it's a powerful weapon, which can make adversaries log in like a normal user for the purpose of persistent and defense evasion. In the end, uh, there are no systems set. We should regularly do the threat hunting and shorten the meantime to detect and meantime to response. So thank you for your listening. And if you have any question, welcome to ask the questions on Discord. Thank you again.